1638, poet John Milton met Galileo, who was elderly at the time and on house arrest, just for the insistence that the earth revolves around the sun. Milton was 30 at the time. Years later, he would include Galileo in his epic poem, Paradise Lost. He wrote, By night, the glass so Galileo observes imagined land and regions in the moon. Galileo was the first human to study the moon through a telescope, and he used this new technology to view the lunar surface. For thousands of years, that's all we could do. We could spy on the moon. It was an impossible distance away. Go with Apollo 11. It was only 50 years ago, on July 20th, 1969, that Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong became the first humans to actually step foot on the lunar surface. It's only been 116 years since the Wright brothers invented the first successful airplane, and less than a century after the birth of aviation, humans made it to the moon. The Eagle has landed. Not only did Armstrong and Aldrin land on the moon, but they also returned safely with the third pilot, Michael Collins. They even went through customs at the Honolulu airport in Hawaii and jokingly filled out the entry form. They declared moon rocks and moon dust, and they reported that they had returned with no additional passengers. President Nixon waving to the astronauts. To they were lucky to be alive. All three of them, but especially Armstrong and Aldrin. You see, after detaching from the command module while moving around the cramped cabin of the lunar module, one of the men accidentally dislodged a circuit breaker that controlled the engines. Then, 30,000 feet above the moon in rapid descent, the module's onboard computer began to send a signal of an alarm. The computer was overloaded for some reason. Each space flight only had two Apollo guidance computers. One was in the command module and the other in the lunar landing module. So you understand, an iPhone today has 100,000 times the processing power of a computer that guided Apollo 11 to the moon. That's enough memory to handle 120 million moon missions all at once from your phone. NASA, Mission Control, they were about 17 seconds away from aborting the mission because of the computer issue. But luckily, thanks to the brilliant work of young coders and engineers, the crisis was averted. The lunar module was dangerously low on fuel. It had only 216 pounds, which Armstrong and Aldrin needed for the ascent. If they had taken 26 seconds longer, Apollo 11 would not have landed. Now imagine, as you're landing, you get a low gas sign on your dashboard. Just as you're landing on the moon and knowing that if you run out of gas, there is no gas station and there's no way for anyone to rescue you. Now in the approach phase. Now Apollo 11's forgotten third pilot, Michael Collins, was tasked with remaining in the command module as Aldrin and Armstrong descended onto the moon. What happens if they don't make it back? A million disasters could have happened. Maybe they would crash, which they sort of did. Maybe the clunky spacesuit would fail. Maybe they would be affected by radiation. Maybe they would get lost, bobbling through the moon's uneven gravity. Maybe the lunar module wouldn't be able to launch. I mean, if anything went wrong, they were stranded. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Collins later said he had nightmares about it that there he was, alone in space, slowly unraveling, literally facing the dark side of the moon. In an interview later with the New York Times, he said, I'm not going to commit suicide. I was coming home by myself, and Aldrin and Armstrong knew that. I mean, I didn't have to discuss it with them. They didn't have to discuss it with me. But it would not have been a good trip home. The scientists at NASA had considered every single possibility, including these ominous outcomes. In fact, President Nixon had asked his speechwriter, William Sapphire, to write a speech and a contingency plan in the event of a tragedy, the Lunar Disaster Plan speech. 30 years later, Sapphire said in an interview, if they couldn't do it, they'd have to be abandoned on the moon and left to die there. The men would either have to starve to death 
or they'd have to commit suicide. The White House knew if that happened, Armstrong and Aldrin would be on their own. NASA would have to cut off all communication, and Nixon would have to call the men's widows. Then he would solemnly read Sapphire's speech to the nation. That speech is gut-wrenching. I had never heard it before. It said, Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery, but they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. These two men are laying down their lives in mankind's most noble goal, the search for truth and understanding. They will be mourned by their families and their friends. They will be mourned by their nation. They will be mourned by the people of the world. They will be mourned by a Mother Earth that dared send two of her sons into the unknown. In their exploration, they stirred the people of the world to feel as one. In their sacrifice, they bind more tightly the brotherhood of man. The speech concluded with a note of triumph. Quote, In ancient days, when men looked at the stars and saw their heroes in the constellations, they could not imagine that in modern times we do much the same, except our heroes are epic men of flesh and blood. Others will follow and surely find their way home. Man's search will not be denied, but these men were the first, and they will remain the foremost in our hearts. For every human being that looks up to the moon in the nights to come will know that there is some corner of another world that is forever mankind. Thankfully, we don't know the words of that speech. History played out differently. The lunar module didn't exactly land gracefully. The cabin wasn't properly depressurized, so when the lander detached, it shot out of the orbiter with enough force that the men landed four miles from their target, but they made it. The door opened and Neil Armstrong looked out at the landscape of gray mush. They had no idea what they were about to feel as he leapt from the ladder onto the moon. I'm gonna step off the lamp now. He spoke these immortal words. That's one small, small step, step for man, for man. one giant man, leap for mankind. President Nixon then made the first ever presidential call to the moon and told the astronauts that the whole world was proud of them and that because of what you have done, the heavens have become part of man's world. Armstrong and Aldrin spent 21 hours on the moon. They ascended without any issues and returned from the command module, gritty from their time on the moon, much to the annoyance of Collins. It's no coincidence that NASA's moon missions were named after Apollo. A towering, complicated figure in ancient Greek mythology, Apollo was the god of music, poetry, and medicine, the patron of sailors, nurturer of the vulnerable, the god of light and sun and knowledge and truth. Apollo represents the best that we as humans can achieve, our human spirit, because we're always dreaming of the next impossible discovery. Before Apollo 11, humans had spent thousands of years desperate to find a way to launch themselves into space, or at the very least, they had intimately stared up at that gray rock above. Because on a quiet night, if the sky is clear enough, we all feel a certain kinship with the moon, and sometimes it looks so close. For whatever reason, we wound up here, on Earth, mostly stuck on land. Despite all of our certainty, we're still clueless about the universe surrounding us, including our own planet. We've only explored about 5% of our ocean. As for outer space, the more we learn about it, the more obvious it becomes that we're in way over our heads. There are 10 times as many stars in space than there are grains of sand on the Earth. The Sahara Desert is 3.5 million square miles of sand. And that's just one of our deserts. The Apollo 11 moon landing 
truly one of our greatest achievements, not as a country, but as mankind. It inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. But there is plenty left over to discover. We are only just beginning to understand our place in this universe. We have an infinite amount of learning to do. We've come to the conclusion that this has been far more than three men on a voyage to the moon. I guess it's time we all learn that there is no final frontier. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown.